Shall we get started? Thank you all for showing up this evening. I'm Anna Leahy, and I teach creative writing in the English department here at Chapman. I want to thank the English department for their support of this Chapman University poetry reading series. I also want to thank my colleague, Logan Estale, yay, for helping me to coordinate this series and for inviting poet and visual artist, Jen Bervin, uh, to campus next Tuesday. She's giving a talk at, I believe, 4 o'clock and a reading at 5.30. And uh, tentatively, that's scheduled in 209A. So sh show up there and we'll direct you where we're supposed to be. Um, on the last Tuesday of April, I want to remind everybody that Chapman's a student literary journal, Elephant Tree, will release this year's issue. And then that evening, the reading will be by MFA students, and they'll be reading their poetry. So as far as I know, all the rest of the events will be in Arduous Forum 209A. And the times are listed on a flyer. If you need a flyer, if you want a flyer to spread the word, let me know. I also want to thank Laura O'Dell, who designed the flyer. <laughs> I, I hope you'll join us for some of those other events. Tonight, we have two poets from Yale University who will read from their work. I'm especially pleased that Richard Deming and Nancy Cool are here to launch this Chapman celebration of National Poetry Month. Richard Deming, Nancy Cool, and I met uh, while in graduate school at Ohio University more years ago than I bothered to count. Uh, it's been a longer time than I, I would like to admit. Nancy and Richard have always challenged me to become a stronger poet and have always supported my work, and I have tried to do the same for them. Nancy once challenged me to write a poem with the title Recidivism, which I did and was po published, so... Um, these, these silly poetry exercises that we do in class actually do turn into poems, and they do matter, and your peers, what they say to you, does matter quite a bit. She has continued to serve as both a careful reader and a quick responder for my poems over the years, including just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Richard has cha challenged me in a variety of ways. He has introduced me to work I might not otherwise have discovered or considered seriously, um, and he's also an extremely good cook. <laughs> Nancy and Richard were also among the first three people I spoke to after my MLA interview with Chapman's search committee, so in a way um, they are attached to my experience getting here. One of the reasons I believe in creative writing programs is because lifelong literary friendships are forged by those circumstances. These two poets have meant a great deal to me, and I met them because of a creative writing program. Together, Richard and Nancy run Phylum Press, which publishes small runs of handcrafted poetry chapbooks and pamphlets. This press is a project that reflects their commitment to poetry and to art, to the human making of things. And you can check the Phylum Press website for more information. They do really beautiful work. Nancy Cool is the author of The Wife of the Left Hand, which is available in the back through the bookstore, and also two chapbooks, The Nocturnal Factory and In the Arbor. Her poetry is published widely in literary journals, and she reviews books regularly. She is and this is a nice long title that she has earned. She is curator of poetry for the Yale Collection of American Literature at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale University. <laughs> and she's earned every letter, every word in that title. As part of her position, she curates reading series and is the author of two exhibition catalogs, one of which is also available at the back of the room, and it's a really beautiful book. Richard Deming is a lecturer at Yale University and the author of Listening on All Sides Toward an Emersonian Ethics of Reading. I'm especially happy that Richard is helping to launch our series because his poetry collection, Let's Not Call It Consequence, has won this year's Norma Farber Award from the Poetry Society of America. This award will be announced officially in New York at the end of this month, right? Um, and it's a, a really wonderful, wonderful award, and, and he deserves it for this book. 
Earlier today, we heard Nancy Kuhl discuss the archive as a historical record of a poet's life that allows us to keep discovering that life that we can never fully understand. Richard Deming, in his talk, proffered the idea that the artist creates history before it has happened. While these two poets have different relationships to history, each is clearly engaged with the world, with history, and with the poetic tradition. You will sense this deep engagement in the poems they read this morning, or this evening. I am happy to bring their voices together here. Please welcome Richard Deming and Nancy Cool. Thank you all so much for being here. Can I be heard all right? Terrific. Um, I'm Nancy Cool, by the way, not Richard Deming, just in case there's any confusion. Uh, um, I first want to uh, thank um, the English department and the folks at the library who have been so welcoming to me, um, and Anna Leahy and Logan Esdale and Doug Deco and Laura O'Dell, who have been terrific hosts um, to both of us. And uh, I'm glad, Anna, that you mentioned um, our continued readership and engagement. Uh, I was just talking about this with uh, Logan's students, um, Logan Esdale's students. Oh, and, and your students were there as well, of course. Uh, talking about The Wife of the Left Hand, which um, I mentioned to the, the class that um, I worked really hard trying to figure out how these foam, poems fit together over a long period of time, and it wasn't until uh, I, f I found a publisher and the sort of um, the time had come, and I had to kind of settle on an order. Um, and. Uh, Anna helped me kind of come up with that order and firm it up. And I feel really grateful and indebted to her still for correcting my thinking about some of the ways I thought this book should fit together. So I'm glad to have you mention that as well. I'm going to start by reading a few poems from uh, The Wife Left Hand, and then I'm going to read a couple, maybe a new poem, and then some work from uh, a relatively new chapbook called The Nocturnal Factory as well. The Wife Left Hand has two title poems, two poems with the title The Wife of Left Hand. I'm actually going to read them both, um, and I'll start with the first one. The Wife of the Left Hand. The backlit town hall clock, mistaken for a low hung moon, keeps the town fast. She, the consort, the comely, the small, getting smaller. It is unnatural, this want for the red mark of the second hand. Lopsided impressions, otherwise empty air, fish and secrets, hurry and gone, and you know full well, cannot hold up, cannot bear her weight. This is the year of without. She speaks bluntly, does not embellish nor beautify. Those morning girls play poolside bridge, smooth legs, tennis skirts, and tall glasses. They sing her to the end of the line. Luxury of what sweet put hands to can mend. Oh, little daughter of the radio, wait and wait for that suggestive slip of voice. Her unhappiness is a blur, a thumb smear on a window, and she is becoming indulgent, sweaty, a little wicked. In her house, it is midnight all day. The wife of the, this book, The Wife of the Left Hand, is interested in, um, I'm interested in it, in uh, exploring um, different traditions and, and ideas about marriage and being a wife and wifehood and what that might mean in um, the 21st century when one is not just a wife but many other things or at least one meaning me hopes to be. <laughs> um, so uh, the poems in here are kind of interested in those ideas um, and uh, this is called Wedding Party. Such a letter of human history, a song and the whole town singing. The bride is luxury and utility. She is the synonym of sex. She aspires to want nothing, not a window or tower, not paint brushes, not a slip bolt lock. She is newly extravagant. I had red hair and what was I going to do with that? Newly sacred. To marry is twin and tangle. A clear plastic bubble cups each pill. Hormones suspend further mystery. In this city, it rains even in the hallways of fine hotels. She thought she'd move toward the skyline, some inevitable next. This is called The Affair of the Fire Eaters. So much better than brittle ash, better than tearing. So much seashell gone silent, spiral, translucent, white burn. The chemical smell of it. A struck match to a photograph, bubbles, blackens, 
Run the film backwards. The fire goes out when he holds the match to the baton. What we do, we do with the body. Home movies emptied onto a sheet hung in the basement. Wife of soot, wife of burnt hair, and the man gone electric. Everything is soaked in the slippery smell of gasoline. The woman he loves holds a drink like you'd hold a pistol. A joke's a joke, so tell it. The fire eater is reckless, head back, eyes wide open, wide open, spilling red reflection. They can't help but think of his salt-cooled mouth. If it's a sideshow, bring them all. I have had uh, this afternoon my very first request for a poem, so I'm going to come back to the wife of the left hand at the end of my reading to tack on a poem that um, uh, one of my new friends here at Tupman asked me to read. But um, before I do that, uh, I'm going to finish up this set from my left hand with the other title poem, in which um, uh, it comes toward the very end of the book, and it's, uh, the title is also the first line, so I'll read it that way. The wife of the left hand is on the bed sweating, without and still. Hurricane of afternoon, lingering smell of seaweed, it must be August. She there, the bed beneath her, everything slightly hazy. The body, no good house, wants what it wants, does not listen. Careless breath all wave and sky sneaks under her eyelid. She pretends not to hear the persistent knock on the screen door. Um, next, I'm going to read a short series of poems. Um, we had Richard spoke earlier today about photography, and uh, Anna and I afterwards were talking quite a bit about um, how complicated photography is uh, as a concept, the way we look at photographs, the way it, uh, what photographs say and don't say about our memories and how our memories work, and um, those kinds of things. And uh, those are some of the, the ideas I'm interested in, these uh, seven short prose poems that um, look like kind of like snapshots <laughs> on the page, <laughs> as you can see. Um, so they're called snapshots, and I'll just read the numbers. They're just they're numbered sections. One, this captured doorway instant, instant in which his body, framed red finally, prepares to disappear, worth a thousand words. It developed, first underleaf yellow, this flat singularity turned distinct, glossy, stopped everything then, like a snap of fingers. As if it could be permanent this moment when the rest of the story hadn't been told, or it tells a story, is a story, backlit, about to turn, the threshold and the day nearly over. Two. What we said added up to amounts now to just more than nothing. Words like blue curves streaking the glass when a car passes almost by heart your voice. One word, tiny secret, the hitch and catch of it skipped behind my ribs like a murmur. Memory of craving, want, 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 and the mouth aches. The room has slipped my mind, but the door, hand poised, prepared to knock. Already we understood the terms. Three, picture it. Color set seamed and drawn in ropey waves, pigment ripples. Shadow, interior, and blue. Open door. Shutter. What's arrested is not our graceless embrace, the kiss on both cheeks instant. Blooming sky where he stands, where he is always standing, framed and framed. Expression I can't make out. What's arrested, held up here in careful fingers, some sliver of a plot now faded past recall. Four. In the end, I played my awkward and underwritten supporting role with a kind of unexpected drunkenness and hip sway swagger. But at our best, we spun words to tender webs, laced a glossed and sugary surface to cover whole nights in sweet translucence. Words like raking light falling in strands from an open door. Then the ache in every knuckle was unmistakable, this stupid body, bare collarbone beckoning. Five, almost fixed, this photograph, this surface, where he stands, always the same story, like I could know everything this minute has to offer, what I wanted to be the object of, what I became instead, a momentary fixture in the little house. I held my throat in my hands to keep from swallowing the precious taste of his voice in my mouth. The second split, 
click and flash, a light you sink into, a light in which you drown. Six. Finally, I understood that the room might as well have had a trap door. It occurred to me that he might be a trick of light. Forgotten details burn blank as the heat of open palm meeting the thin skin near the corner of the eye. Flash and blur and gasp. Parting, I concealed pitiless curiosity, my insatiable interest in the curl of my fingers pressed firmly to his shoulders, in the silent breath where my lips nearly met his skin. Seven. The man small enough now to rest in the palm of my hand, every color in raking light gathered or smooth or let loose to fray, still present in the frame. I could know everything this moment has to offer. Overexposure bleeds the edges white. Whatever else, there was collapsibility in that present, in this transparent present tense, plastic promise concentrated in trice, slanting radiance in flashpoint and flicker. I'm going to um, read now a few poems from uh, The Nocturnal Factory, which is a chapbook that was published earlier this year by um, a great little press called Ugly Duckling Press that's published in Brooklyn. It's a collective of really interesting um, folks who select works of that they all agree on. There's 10 or 12 of them on the collective board, and they work together to make these beautiful books. It's, it was a real pleasure to work with them. Um, the poems in the Nocturnal Factory are all uh, sort of interested in, um, uh, obsessed with uh, things like um, sleeplessness and um, dreaming and in insomnia, I was about to say, which is of course the same thing as sleeplessness. I'm a terrible sleeper, you'll have guessed by now. Um, uh, but And sort of nighttime pursuits, thoughts about uh, haunting and um, those kinds of things and uh, ghostliness and that sort of stuff. So. Um, I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read four or five poems from this collection that all have to do with those ideas, obviously. This is called Unhearing Voices. It's in five short sections. One, the hand and what we catch hold of point always to the far edge and the dream of bones perfectly and cleanly broken. Now the clear blue context rushes, slips through fingers, spilling away in streams in swift rivulets. Two, once familiar sound, distinct and distant as bells at the hour. This recognition, this broken long return, finds every silence in the living body, fills even the otherwise agreeable mouth. Three, the dead keep talking, each syllable churns and grinds, persuasive as axle and singing gears, steady as a machine. Four, Empty apartment where moss and mushrooms grow green, black, and brown in the cavity of the refrigerator. Tree limbs break the window glass with their reaching. The final crumbling is hastened by even the smallest noises, settling their unbearable weight on warped and splitting floorboards. Five, time has fingers like knives, talking and not harmless. Voice the ghost at the edge of everything and the nervous system crackling. This is the title poem, it's called Nocturnal Factory. Caught in the crack between one, excuse me, I'm gonna start over. Caught in the crack separating one day from the next. The first dream breath aches in sleep-soaked lungs. It finds in due course one or another kind of focus. Slips watery into moonlit view or surfaces from some depth with a gasp. Like a foot asleep, pins and needles, pins and needles. Always left hungry, left plunging toward dark's inevitable response, if you can call that choking near asphyxiation a response. All winter I wrote everything down. I wouldn't have imagined I imagined such things. Recurring, the near stranger I always recognize. His coarse form smells metallic as dark wine. Eyes grab at everything, even what I've hidden. Mouth designed to smother his hands, he turns when I or the swimmer will choke, drown, go missing among the rough oyster beds and their insufficient harvest. The light is oceanic, green, and barely light at all. The clutch of it, the hold it has, a mysterious and vaporous power. The spherical glass capsule contains some volatile liquid for inhalation. Knock me, knock me out. Pry into the dream's body, 
lift its dense, hot organs one by one and place them on the table. Slice each open in blue light broken and broken by the room's chill and shiver, the hanging lamp's unavoidable sway. Record what you find there. I risk listening again for more bits of the script. I didn't write this story and who knows how it ends if I discover what I'm expected to say, if I say it. Wake and turn to the window. Second story view is cracks in pavement, sight line to the end of the block. Next door house lit even, in the, lit even in the center of night's bleak revolution. None of this tells you much about whom you love. And in any case, eventually you lose your footing, slip into the same sleep all over again. In this way, nights string themselves, iridescent pearls, flawless strand. Again, the painful breath of evening and the sleeper knows the time is coming, will come. This is called The Truth About the Dead. That they surrender their eyes, that they have almost nothing, that they already know everything about appetites, about devouring, that if you let them, they'll surround you like fog, they'll lodge in your throat. And they are clay eaters who understand thirst, that every vibration sounds a warning and minor shadows and subtle drops in temperature predict. And they pick clean the bones and they whisper, what will you do to have it? That what you've heard about vexation and difficulty breathing, about craving and flush hot skin, hot breath, the clutch and grasp of embrace, all of it is true. That they whisper at first, but then. That I call them too, that I beg. That they turn their countless faces in our direction or tilt them skyward. That they ignore the wasps rushing through their wanting hands, swirling around them in steady and endless flight. That they believe enough time makes us all the same. And theirs is the language of gradual decay, that it works the way vines weave a fence, that you have good reason to be afraid. This is called Catalog and Lexicon, and it sort of is a catalog of, uh, you may recognize um, some figures from mythology and fairy tales and that sort of thing, um, but they're all intermingled with things from my own um, imaginary uh, myths <laughs> and my own dreams and that sort of thing. Catalog and lexicon, an unsympathetic ghost demanding. The man on whom nothing is lost lets go his tree dark voice in swirls around the house, the tabletops, wild over endless acres and boats anchored in the narrow passage. The sand and tide, the blooming garden, the bowls of yellow wine, every last bomb and the shifting and fearful, the unearned confidence, these he gives the eldest. The youngest is fist tight, bruised knuckle, unearthing her distance and her return. Day and day and day thereby. A spine straight lighthouse man turns the prying beam out across the open midnight, the, th the sea thrown wide. Absent the first time, after the sudden slip, the sudden lost footing, finds her in the end, weightless, following a most unlikely chain of events. Says, remember, remember, remember. An ancient apotheosis of the shining sky, god of the elements of rain, wind, thunder, lightning, stands atop a bald hill, mostly without brides. Pours out the contents of his fantastic skull. Cronos, the father of Zeus, Zeus, the father of Aphrodite. Always, always, always. The keeper of the library of appetites patiently collects our craving, keeps a detailed catalog of every thirst, every amazement. He fills our dreaming with smoke-blind hours in the dangerous gap between sleep and waking, with gulp after sooty gulp of hot air and hot ash. The walls give way. Still, he climbs in our estimation when we hear those loose bullets rattle in his pocket. Begot, begot, begot. The fine woodsman sends his children into the dismal forest, where the cottage, where the witch, where the oven. Afraid, he sets the child upon a bough, no, upon a float, puts him right down in the course and rush and goes on, or agrees to this. The little king of everything knows the weight of our lungs and the scars marking fingers, arms, each contour, every uneven pink-white seam where skin slip, split and came eventually together all over again.
This is the last poem in this uh, collection. It's called Charms Against the Ghost. On docks, on boardwalks, on dry wood and splinter. And the bent crooked house, wasps nests in the eaves, wings in the chimney, chipped plaster seams, the beams, the joints in the wall. This enduring house, this house with its mouth sewn shut. Panic hums, lips pressed uneven, mouth a twisted musicless crease. Burn the picture, emulsion blisters blue, then black, ash brittle and thin, flakes away on house currents. Old letters are also bad habits and don't always burn easily. You'd be surprised how long. Swallow aspirin after aspirin, the tiny pink chalk baby kind, but the headache persists. Fingernails tear stockings to prove the skin beneath. She falls into it, this habit of thinking like a wife. In the winter dream of sewing machines and faintly penciled, penciled slanty scripted ransom notes, a pitchy dark and darker collection of sparrows lift together at once as I pass. Unwrap the answer. Slip its sticky revelation past parted lips, tongue past teeth to sugary ache to sweet dissolution to vanishing. On sidewalk and blacktop on highways and highways. Birds or leaves shadow overhead like kites, and I'll whisper every secret back into its bottle. And um, thank you very much for your attention, and um, it's a pleasure being here. I'm going to read one more poem. <laughs> and uh, for, um, like I said, uh, Annie, who's um, one of the students here in the graduate program who I uh, had the pleasure of meeting in Chicago at the AWP conference, um, asked me to read. This is the last poem in The Wife of the Left Hand. It's called Ghost Town, and it's in the form of a, um, of a chant, a kind of, you know, with a repetition um, built in in the way that works. It's called Ghost Town. I am the square of light that falls on the pears in the basket. I am the white sphere of the plate. I am the honeysuckle held to your flat tongue, the sugary drop. I am the subtle nick of a needle, and I am the bottle's stout neck. I am the leaves twisted to braid the flowers, and I am the unexpected weight of the boughs. I am the waves past the high dunes crash and pull the salt air, and I am the water's surface, green, gray, and still out of sight. I am the crack and snap of wind in the ship's halyards or a flag at half mast. I am the doctor's cold hands pressed to your belly, your ribs, your spine. I am the body you reach for at midnight, the body you reach for in the gray hour before day. Who were you the night the pavement split and slid? The night fire cracked the earth open and I fell into its mouth. Who were you when uneven air shook the wings? And now, turning a flawless plum in your hands, and after, lips and teeth and tongue, the sweet red bite. Who will you be when the rooms are empty, when wind swings the door wide? Thank you very much. Speak at this. In a clear chromosomal light of sudden hearing, the tongue's such an unlikely weight. Not nothing now, some silence attests what more, what noun does not do. That is to say, syllables coordinate vanishing in the ledger of lost chances. Try this. If an apple, then exile. A pomegranate, then wintering descent. A glance backward, and the pupils of the eyes become a banishment. What Echo said was a name not worth repeating, and thus this beautiful daughter slides her thumb along her lower lip. It blooms, it shatters. Um, I'm going to read um, back and forth, I think, between um, what's not called consequence and which Anna had mentioned, and a new manuscript that I'm working on that's called um, Day for Night. Which uh, is a big film school, I hear. So, day for night is a film term in which you um, film during the day, but you use like a blue filter and, and such to make it look like night. It does not always convincing, but you take uh, you take the, the message. Uh, and in that book, I do a lot of 
um, alluding to film and um, art, um, because one of the things that I'm interested in in all my work, if you heard the talk to earlier today, that I'm interested in the intersections of philosophy and poetry and painting and photography. And so when I'm working on this new book, I wanted to bring these things in conversation again. Um, generally, I try to have it so you don't need to have known the, the, the reference. I give you hopefully enough information. Uh, and this poem is called, is like that, it's called After Kurosawa, and Akira Kurosawa is one of the great Japanese directors, and uh, it deals with the, po the movie Rashomon, um, which is really, if you've never seen it, it's one of the most important films ever made, and I really give you all that you need to know in this. The only thing that might confuse you if you don't know it is, Toshiro Mifune was the star of the movie and one of the great actors, and so I refer to Mifune. After Kurosawa for Patricia Willis. In Rashomon, the rain does not sleep. Sounds like ink-darkened pages, turning then unwriting themselves. In the unrecognizably literal forest, likeness is like falling, like catching, like falling. It is human nature to fall into the middle of things. What matters is that in this tale, someone's dead, murdered, tied to a post, and things unsaid. Some arctic continent of unspeakable names opens wide round. Mifune conjures close a relentless ghost deeper than you think, and who will speak for it? That's where you come in. Remember me, remember what is here, what is white, what is true, what is heat. As you turn to go, the weave of threadbare scrolls goes slack. The day becomes a draft of distances no one can bear. Still it moves, look tell, look tell, look tell. In the coming dark, everyone left until the room spun against its own unblinking. Not even the story owns its own moment. And later, who would not wish in the want-nothing light to wear a face just like the rain in Rashomon? I was just trying to think up some snappy patter there. <coughs> That's why there was a pause. <coughs> and I started choking. <coughs> That's hilarious. <coughs> and then he had an embolism. You know, something. I'd make the news. Poet, dead, Chapman. <laughs> news at six. <coughs> Speaking of which, remains to be seen. I wish I were the moon, he said, with nothing certain except what remains is the smoke from far off villages and the question that lingers, what did one come to expect of these lives anymore? Tongue wanders, wanders listless amid cavities and contusions. We never moved our eyes from each other. How much night needs a last cruel tune, the blood in the porcelain sink lit from above by a single bulb, the silver fixtures. Tired and troubled, the sound afflicts more than sleep. Wake the substitute, the odd order of fledgling witnesses to that holy other life found sidelong amongst reflections in a cafe window. Add this promise to the luck of starting out. Soot-covered song in factories all undone. Then the dream of red noses and floppy shoes seems less than unreal. He bared his throat to her, the glassy flesh, its sudden and terrible distractions, rendering the present blind. Brick tears the fleshly cheek. Then the dark underneath pushes fingernails into the heath. What does it mean to forget the plot of every French film? To resemble is to reassemble. I own nothing but my own dead. One of the things that I tend to to do is stay up really late, and that's when I um, write my poems mostly. You know, after Nancy's gone to bed and maybe I've watched a movie, usually a zombie film, and she goes to bed and then I start writing. So a lot of the, the poems tend to be really kind of about um, staying up late, <laughs> staying up late, 
it being dark, me feeling lonely, <laughs> and zombies. <laughs> the sound of things and their motion. All night, the blank page. All night, the unopened book beat its black wings against the glass, and I woke forgetful. Just like in the movies, the girl is there, then gone, each frame suspended mid-air. This moment, wherever it finds us, is neither mine nor yours. A place with no single word rises around us with the bare suddenness of a house, wherein one finds an unstained coffee mug, a cigarette burned to ash. An iris rots in a vase above the fireplace, which I mattered, which earned its belonging. The nerves, their graceless hum, now quieted. At times, the window and everything in it is blue. The wish to damage and deny is its own season. Unless an omen overwhelms the willow, the pond is dried up and gone, and every proposition forgets the one before it. The camphor field, between grapes and echoes, blazes until it's darkening. Nothing candles the heart so much as loss. Names tell me names to trace the ways back towards the saying of some delicate, some infinitely stuttering thing. Actually, I should probably mention it, that there's a line in that the pond is dried up and gone and every proposition forgets the one before it. One of the things that I'm interested in, in terms of my po poetics, and it's not in every poem, um, and the book, again, is called Let's Not Call it Consequences, is um, wanting to work or think against um, predeterminations of form that come often in the form of a sentence or grammar. Like, for instance, um, so if you're noticing, sometimes it's hard to follow the, the poems and its propositions. It's because I wanted to um, disrupt it. Um, because one of the things that I notice is that even in the course of saying the sentence, which you've never heard me utter the sentence before, and no one has uttered, uttered this exact sentence before, we kind of know what I'm going to say before I even say it, period, because we have these things such as punctuation marks, comma, which might take the form of commas, comma, colons, comma, semicolons, comma, and so forth, period. So these things kind of set up this way of, of anticipating what's coming. So you're kind of filling in blanks just ahead of my saying it. And we know we can prove this because we have friends that f finish our sentences for us all the time, right? So one of the things that I wanted to do is what happens if you let your mind or let the, the sentence turn back on itself, become aware that it's going someplace and wanting to, to not have us just follow through on a conclusion and radically change its direction. So one of the things that I try to do is do that. So we have to stick with the word, or stick with the sentence sort of every step of the way and discover what it's trying to say as it goes along. Um, like I say, I don't do that in every poem, but that's something maybe helpful to know as we get into this. By the time you read this. And when at last the stars did not tremble and the page would not take a desperate ink, the night this rounded night, night of riot and thistle, framed a place of re-entry, its humility a kind of fragrant desire, such sleep as this. Be relentless, said the cold pair atop the formica table, a wasp piercing its core, the mouth a blackened rose, a bloom too much to bear. Uh, fairly short one called um, Honus Mirabilis, Miracle Year. Um, and actually, this is, uh, if you heard my talk today, I was talking about Jonathan Williams. And uh, this is actually inspired by a trip to visit uh, Jonathan and his partner, Tom Meyer, at their place in North Carolina that Nancy and uh, two other friends of ours took. So Honus Mirabilis. One day when there is no breath, thus no longer song, no incantatory forgiving algebra for the open window and the wind and the wasps stirring along the sill in late March. Not cinder, not smoke, and what all else that will not be there no more. Is it enough then to glimpse another's reflection in a picture window backed by night, lit by Chilean wine and soft voices? 
the melon syrup slicks someone's cheek, a napkin thick with the scent of currants and folded in thirds falls to the floor. Outside, the lawn furniture levitates above the sleepy eyes of mute animals led astray. No other world but this, this. Uh, and this poem's called Caravaggio Dreams. Um, I'm really interested in art, but most of the time I'm not interested in art that happens before the 20th century. So go figure. Mm. If it looks like something, I probably don't like it. Um, but, I'm, but that said, I'm really interested in Caravaggio, who did the really beautiful, a lot of his, his paintings are allegorical, you know, Christian themes. And, um, but he was really radical, you know, wanted for murder, um, gay, really fascinating figure. And if you look, a lot of critics and scholars look at his paintings and see these really homoerotic um, themes that, that are in his work. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was, for instance, think of The Calling of St. Matthew, which is probably his most fam famous painting, and really think about bringing all of that complexity of, um, of the story of the disciples and Christ, and just thinking about it in those kinds of terms as well, and like sort of like social bonding and masculinity and homosociality and, you know, guys, you know, broke back mountain, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know what I'm saying. Uh, Caravaggio dreams. So I wanted to, to sort of, um, I don't know, make that and uh, do my own sort of Caravaggio thing. So I was thinking of Caravaggio. I, I, the title means either a, a um, Caravaggio is dreaming this or a dream that's like Caravaggio it's called Caravaggio dreams so kind of a sexy dream you know what I'm saying Caravaggio dreams in any place denial like night begins doesn't it thus one could say as if flesh were frightened by an insistent anger or an old story worth believing once a ship set forth now a shuttered window frames false promises such as it is dark and it is light and these are not choices but the most awkward invocations. In my hand there are five cards all aimed toward failure or so go the odds. Around this table those who do not look up at the returned man balance the one who does count the coins. Not every outstretched hand sketches a first desire, but Matthew, mouthing some rough plea, calculates the very shadowed place that opens athwart a younger man's smooth chest and other tongues follow me that names its moment like the sunlight falling around some hopeful, some hapless thing. Um, and since I did that, well, I don't know. Maybe I hold the hold that one. Um, here are three prose uh, poems. Um, like I said, I'm interested in doing. They're called ekphrastic poems, poems that are responding to art. And I think of film as art, and I think of zombie movies as art. So I have a sequence of three um, prose poems. And the first one is after George Romero, Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Diary of the Dead. The second one is Takahashi uh, Mieke, who is a Japanese film, filmmaker, does J, what they call J-horror, and his film is Audition, brilliant. And the last one is Sam Raimi, who did Spider-Man, but also Evil Dead movies. And if you've not seen any of these, hopefully that's okay. You've probably seen, you know what the zombie movie is talking about. You've seen The Simpsons, they do those things. So, film threat after George Romero, Takashi Miike, and Sam Raimi from Mike Kelleher. One. The survivors barricade a bay window with plywood, an old armoire, an empty refrigerator, and it is dark enough within to read by candlelight. Through a crack, you can see two eyes and a mouth in shadow and a night filled with intent, glittering teeth. What the image tells us the hunger of the zombie, however slow, does not sleep and that the cottage and everyone in it is surrounded by rage. 
And inside, no one will admit the possibility of cowardice aloud, even as the wine is decanted, the cream sauce simmers, and Mendelssohn plays on a stereo somewhere in the background. But maybe we have it wrong. The dead do not hate the living. Love hates the dead for being dead, and again and again summons them back because of this. One day, and soon, the boards will come down and the zombies will break in and devour everything in their path and yet someone will raise a shotgun and shoot the beloved who is no longer the beloved but something else, some other wanton thing that wears a recognizable face and someone in the audience will wonder if that is how we are meant to survive our memories. Two. If a black phone sits on an apartment floor, then a middle-aged widower will surprise himself, placing a call, and then he's been alone for seven years. Then, on the other side of the city, another phone will ring nine times, each a small and reasonable hope. Then, on the other end, a shy, beautiful woman with dark hair will answer. If she answers, then she is dressed all in white and kneels on the floor. Then she will tell him with her quiet and open voice, she is surprised that he would call. Then her head hangs down as she speaks, her long hair covering her face almost completely. If there are no windows where she is, then she does not yet know that he has already lied to her out of his sadness. Then he does not know that she has been kneeling like this in the dark for hours. Then they will make plans to meet for dinner, and then she will smile, and she will hang up the receiver. Then he will be relieved and excited, and so then, in the room just beyond the black phone, a body inside a canvas bag, cinched closed, suddenly struggles one last moment, then stops. If so, and knowing we know that, we do not avert our eyes, do not stop listening, then there are such terrible, such familiar thirsts. These do not hide for long, no matter how white a dress may be, or how, or how many times a phone might ring, and so this cannot end well. Three. What is it we don't do well enough that we're constantly afraid? For the insomniac night is a book that will not stop letting itself be read. Now it's dark. A young couple, beautiful but not too bright, arrives in a yellow Oldsmobile. And when some uninvited thing rushes towards the door, someone else would know not to open it. There will be a botched incantation, and someone won't survive because the words went wrong. In an empty room, in the coldest shadows of some forgotten house, an older man's voice echoes on a reel to reel. He is a disappointed father who tells a secret history over and over, and who, once long ago, was rent asunder by voices in a dark cellar. Remember me. Startled anew, don't ask why it's always like this. You already foresee an answer with bared teeth, and the things beneath the stairs will not close their eyes. Each of us a small, nearly forgotten body, spinning and falling like a long kiss or a bad dream or the sound of celluloid catching fire. Um, this is a longer poem. Called, um, if, did you guys see the movie 300? Yeah, no. Uh, if you did, you have all you need to know. If you didn't, maybe you know your, your Greek history. The Battle of Thermopylae is when the 300 Spartans held off the, the Persian army. And in sort of our democratic uh, mythology, this is one of the, you know, this is where the small band fought off the great empire. Um, and so really sort of interested in that story, especially at a time when empire is, we're the democracy and yet we kind of look like an empire sometimes. So it's sort of thinking through this in contemporary terms and it falling apart and falling together. So it's called, that's the Battle of Thermopylae, 300, same thing. Sparta. So, <laughs> the visual. I'll just do this the whole time. <laughs> Shall I read from the history of the Battle of Thermopylae? Now that there is nothing left, for instance, the taste of fear dries the upper lip. Wood doves rustle, coppery wings along city gates. What I want is to not want, not you, not the scent of mango, not the livid faces of fashion models, their necks arching perversely upward, not a single moment. 
The cigarette smoke's shapes augur thirty mornings of fraught silences, cold tea, that flickering anger of morning talk shows, and an empty table set for three, for you, for me, for the polite ghost of intensest manners. At quince, no one will eat rolls behind the stove, cold to the touch. When things go bad, it gets like this. Where is the gift of sudden continuity? Dare say no into an open well, or we'll all drown of such falling. The, the field of middle distance is dry, sepia-colored corn stalks strewn all around, pointing a given direction. Sing out the measure of a narrow past. I've been lost here before, with thumb and forefinger blot out the sun, pilgrim, so as not to turn my back, trembling shine towards the unspeakably insistent. With the lights out, it's not so far. In the movies, it's called Day for Night, and I will open my eyes to a shadow cut in the shape of your mouth. In the pattern of ten stars and three thousand times three thousand pearly eyes of gutted mackerel, the map home is a, log is a logic of longitude and shame. What if you were a Persian king, ashes covering your forehead, your eyelashes, your scarred right cheek? How would you arrive across a trail of broken leaves, mercury poisonings, the ocean's systemic threat and verdict? Would you take the shore borne aloft on a dozen strong backs? And when articles of faith fashion a loosened garment, the disheveled will not return. In the days before now, before this one stretched out so wide round us, I wanted a direct address. In something else I wanted to say, and yet I do not know how to ask for fresh water, for a ripened date, for three pomegranate seeds. On the last night of the sordid republic, a soldier's wife waves goodbye as the right nipple thickens in the cold, pressing itself against her blue t-shirt. A bright proximity is a wrong kind of silence. In this garden of unregenerate narrative, see words but think arrows darkening the sky. For the unseen, read loss. For every comma, reckon the ways hope can pierce the sternum in half. A rose leans near the open window and thrushes play at voices, the world thus put under by verb and noun. A husband runs headlong towards the river while over his shoulder the cottage window brackets the wife's face in an attic room. Drapes stir, then she's gone as each promise he does not keep. Drifts down past the walls, along the paths to the sea, there where children and old widows heap up driftwood and dried seaweed. And this is, so please it, where I am loved. There are such Spartas. O, oh. as an O, oh. O, oh, this thing I see before me, is it a microphone? O, oh. the beautiful mouth aflame again, shape of such ache and plenty, disastrous intent, reckon your ascent, and scares and feeble unforgivings. What's the use of ladders anyways, climbing's too far? The hand doesn't care, the ear doesn't know, the leg's done in. This is the part where you laugh. Piece it together and I promise the tongue will take it apart. I'm just going to do uh, two more. Uh, one a little longer and one very short. The last of New England. I'm from New England and so... It's become a very different place, and there's a famous movie called The Last of England. And so I was sort of thinking through that. Um, the Last of New England. A curtain and faint, diffused light begin here. The phone rings, and someone is listening, and some cold voice articulates, Come in, come in, come on in. Autumn masks the hum of an AM radio. The dial left, then right as anger tightens ligature or bond, and then the blood, and then the bone. On the desk beneath the window is a leather book, a paper clip, the photo of a bearded singer who leans his head back against the wall of some boarded tenement. He does not look at the camera while at his lip, the cigarette's ash and filter is the open mouth of a September morning. 
In unpainted rooms with wooden chairs, we learned slow hymns and plaintive uncertainties to weave a present tense out of so much loss. Dispatches from the coast. Fatigue is a river. The Merrimack, Charles, Concord, Connecticut, Housatonic, every name and inter alia of reckoning that breaks for the sea and some last best wish. Inside a shabby apartment, place your face against cool kitchen tiles, black and white, cracked towards the direction of the fault lines that keep the widow up all night pacing the roof. Can she see the milk-white sin beyond all reason? In any given direction, a mast, a merry pole, a charred smokestack, remote and without shadow, there's always a way in. The calendar reads X and X and X and O. I want to say sky, say table, say tomorrow and last week. To voice some Lenten contentment, the odd orison of strength and retreat. But some days the arch of the left hand sustains a paltry curse against half-closed doors. The arm of a corpse catches on the branches along the banks. The last lee shore looms close by, and the words you sent and the frosty torchlight passes over the back alley where the ransom tree counts out scars and debts. There is no green like that, green which is not to say the day and all it resolves. In sand and mortar and dread and tar and drowning and dregs and leaves. The junkie tattoos on her cheek an S, the first letter among the last days and the telling noise of slipping out, mechanisms for counting up the size of such minor solace. I love the cost of small talk, its shallow owning up to a life of sundry atonement. The factory closes and months later dozens of dried chicken legs all torn at the knuckle hang from twine in the slow heat. If there is a darkness yet to be owned, to be earned from wages of a half intent, syllable of a mortal belonging, spin the girl in the silken dress till the lights come up and the credits roll. And uh, I'm going to do this one last really short one, but I want to thank Logan Esdale and uh, Anna Leahy for their stewardship and their uh, companionship and their graciousness and the students that I've met today asking great questions and Prov provoking and laughing when necessary. <laughs> uh, and the English department as a whole, it's been really great. It's been um, terrific to be here at Chapman. A lot of people, when we said we were coming, said, that's an up-and-coming place. And uh, it's been true. So thanks for up and coming to this reading. <laughs> that was good, huh? <laughs> so this is the last one. So again, thanks so much for coming in case of emergency. Stay with me, lexicon, until morning, when dawns the boundary music by which to sound action or thing. If there's a difference, let's kiss. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Um, we've run the, the poets pretty ragged today. <laughs> um, we, we did allow them to eat a little lunch. Um, they'll stick around for a few minutes. Some of you may have books to sign, so I'll ask them to just stay up here. You can bring your books up. If you have individual questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to have a, a short chat. If you liked their work at all, buy their books. Poets need support. The books are here. I encourage you to to take a book home, share it with your friends and family. Also, uh, there is food in the back, and uh, make sure that you pick some of that up because it's all paid for, and uh, <laughs> you, you can stuff your bags on the way out. <laughs> so thank you again for showing up. Show up again next Tuesday for those events. <laughs>